Thank you, Bill, so much. And uh, thank you to the group and the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. It's a great treat uh, to meet with all of you. Uh, as as uh, Jeff just said, ECMO is a team sport, and there are lots of people involved, and I get to uh, interact with uh, many of those teams. But meeting with the perfusionists is the best for me because you understand it from scratch. Usually the first week is involved in, in uh, learning elementary physiology, but you live there every day, so it's really it's really fun to jump to the, to the uh, important stuff when it comes to uh, cardiac and pulmonary support systems. Well, the uh, complex title of this talk was actually invented by Bill, and it's actually a very good <laughs> title. It rambles on a bit, but, uh, but I'm gonna spend just a few minutes talking about that title, and then we have a very special treat for you uh, at the end of this talk that I, I know you're going to not only enjoy, but uh, remember for years and years. Uh, so, we, again, we're back to this title of auction delivery in VV ECMO or VA ECMO for that matter. And it really is just a simple matter of understanding the physiology. You guys understand it quite well. Your clinical MD colleagues and nursing colleagues have forgotten this. So we're in an era when uh, the most important thing about ECMO is just education of people who should understand uh, basic physiology and uh, how, to, how to make that education happen. Simulation is a great way to do it, by the way. Uh, so the, the end of my talk is this. Auction, uh, oxygenated blood in ECMO uh, mixes with the deoxygenated venous blood, and the result is desaturated blood in the aorta. And the ox amount of oxygen delivery should be at least three or four times oxygen consumption, so you have to know those variables in order to successfully manage a case. So that's, that's the sum total of it right there. Now, uh, with that, we'll go on to the next couple of slides just to reiterate, again, what all of you know very well. This uh, describes the, uh, everything there is to know about critical care except for kidneys. So 80% of it is here, and it's just a matter of understanding this. Make sure I can get the pointer. So the metabolism in all tissues proceeds at a certain rate, and it's uh, run by metabolism, which is burning up foodstuffs, fat, carbohydrate, protein with oxygen, and that produces energy, which makes the heart cells and the muscle cells and the brain cells work, and it proceeds at a certain rate that we call the basal metabolic rate. It goes higher with sepsis or work or catecholamine drugs, but it's measured uh, by measuring the amount of oxygen that's consumed in the process. That oxygen gets there from the arterial blood. It's the amount of oxygen in arterial blood times the blood flow, which is the oxygen delivery. And normally the oxygen delivery is five times consumption. And there's um, an elaborate system of homeostatic mechanisms to keep that ratio at five to one. In the same process, CO2 is produced at about the same rate as oxygen is consumed, and it's ventilated off via the lung. Uh, and generally speaking, it's much less significant issue than oxygenation. This has the same information, uh, but uh, in this case, with numbers on it. So the normal oxygen consumption is about 120 cc's per square meter per minute for older children and adults, and uh, the oxygen delivery is 600 cc's per square meter per minute. That's the oxygen content of 20 cc's of oxygen per deciliter times the normal cardiac output, three liters per square meter per minute, gives you 600 cc's per square meter per minute. Freshman physiology, it's amazing how this is being forgotten over time. And here's the most important part of all this and the part that is forgotten. Here's the three ways to measure the amount of oxygen in blood. Uh, two of them are really easy. One, the other one is more difficult. Uh, two of them are not important at all. Only one is important, but it's the one that we find difficult to measure. So here's arterial blood, PO2 saturation, venous blood, PO2 saturation in normal blood, and so the normal 
amount of oxygen in or normal arterial blood is 20 cc's per deciliter, whether it's a newborn or an ancient person or someone, an exercising athlete, whoever it is, that's the normal number, and that's the number that we ought to create in our patients uh, when oxygen delivery and consumption is an issue. Here's the amount of oxygen content in anemic blood and very anemic blood, or in very, very anemic blood. The PO2 is still 90, the saturation is still 95, but there's not very much oxygen there in the blood, and therein lies the problem. So uh, Steve Conrad gave you a beautiful review of this just a few minutes ago, uh, but just to repeat it, if the, the normal oxygen consumption is uh, three cc's per kilogram per minute, that's about the same as 120 cc's per square meter per minute. This is normal metabolism for an adult, and the normal delivery is five times that, so that is the exact normal point. That's where you're all living right now, basically. If you're sedentary, not exercising, not moving around, you're at this point, which means the ratio is five to one, and your venous saturation, therefore, is 80%. It just happens that if you remove 20% of the oxygen, the saturation goes from 100% to 80%. We use that oversimplification a lot, and it's a little misleading because, as I just told you, the saturation doesn't really represent the content. Nonetheless, this is the normal point. So if the oxygen delivery is decreased for some reason, anemia, hypoxemia, low cardiac output, the metabolism goes on at the same rate. There's a huge safety factor built in. So if you drop your cardiac output from five to four to three to two to one and a half liter per minute, you're fine. Your metabolism will cook along uh, as at a normal rate. However, when this ratio drops uh, below two to one here, and I can tell you why it's two to one, the venous sets 50%, Whenever you're on this side of the curve, there's not enough oxygen there to run the metabolic machinery. So the metabolism continues, but it continues as anaerobic metabolism and lactate is produced. So whenever you drop under this side of this curve, you start making lactate. That's really helpful because if you measure the lactate, it'll tell you how often and how long you drop below the critical delivery relationships. The same is true if the metabolic rate changes, if it goes down or if it goes up. Here's what I just showed you, and here's twice normal metabolic rate. That's what you will have as soon as you stand up and walk out of this room. You'll be at about twice normal rate. If you jog out of this room, it'll be about three or four times normal rate. Uh, if your patient gets septic, it goes to about twice normal rate. But the same relationships apply. So if the metabolic rate doubles, then the delivery doubles and the ratio is still maintained at five to one and the safety factors are still here. You can still decrease delivery, but when you get to that two to one ratio, bad things happen. So summarizing all of that, here's the normal relationship between metabolism and delivery. During this phase, we're using up oxygen reserves, but still doing very well. As soon as we drop over into this zone, and lactate is produced and anaerobic metabolism is happening. So when we translate all that to veno-venous ECMO, here shown as a double lumen catheter, we drain venous blood, we oxygenate it, we pump it back into the right atrium, and there the oxygenated blood mixes with whatever venous blood did not go through the circuit. So the resulting arterial blood will be a mixture of the native venous return and the amount of, amount of oxygenated blood returned to the patient. We monitor the things in these boxes and we have to know oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery in any given patient. And of course, you do that every day in the operating room. Here's how much oxygen delivery I'm going to need. But in the ICU, people have forgotten about this. And we use that information to regulate the variables of oxygen delivery. Here's just an example with using content. If the venous blood content happens to be nine cc's per deciliter, that tells you the hemoglobin is about 11. Uh, in this patient, that blood mixes with the 100% percent 
saturated blood with an oxidation content of 14, and the systemic result has a content of about 12. Uh, and uh, because of the composition of that blood, the PO2 will be about 45 or 50, and as long as the cardiac output is adequate, that's perfectly fine. We can go through the arithmetic of all of this. We won't take time to do it now, but if we know the native venous oxygen content and the ECMO content flow, then we put the amount of those flows together related to cardiac output, come out with the arterial content. Obviously, if you reverse the equation, you can calculate the cardiac output if you know the other variables. You can do the same arithmetic with saturation. Uh, it's a little bit misleading, as I said, but it's an easy way to do it. So that uh, whenever we have a patient on venovenous bypass, the native venous saturation is somewhere between uh, 80 and 50% and we mix that blood with the 100% oxygenated blood coming out of the circuit. If, if the venous sat, for example, is 50 and the arterial saturation is 80, that tells you there were equal amounts of natus, native venous return and ECMO flow, which tells you the cardiac output. And as a, a way to simplify that is if you can calculate how much oxygen a 80 kilogram person would need, three cc's per kilogram, 240 cc's a minute, and take that person's requirement in a VV ECMO circumstance, you can see how the amount of flow that is required relates to the amount of hemoglobin. So this brings up the key of this whole discussion, uh, whether it's simulation or patient care or day-to-day uh, -day management, uh, the, the, the one most important number has come to be hemoglobin. That's because we manage it so badly. Somewhere that came this idea, it's okay to be anemic if you're sick. And if you're really sick, you ought to be really anemic. Where did that idea come from? It's preposterous. That affects you more than anybody because you're told that coming off bypass, the hematocrit ought to be 26 or something like that. And you can do that because the patient's cold and you're going to get him out of the OR. As soon as he gets to the ICU, he can't even roll over in bed because he's so profoundly anemic. Where did this idea come from? Well, the idea is that there's a terrible risk to transfusion. Well, there isn't any risk to transfusion compared to being dead. So, so that uh, when it comes to ECMO, uh, the most important thing is to be sure, first of all, the hemoglobin is normal and a lot of other things will follow. My ECMO practice these days is all by telephone. About once a week I get a phone call from someone somewhere in the world saying this ECMO thing isn't working at all because of blah, blah, blah. And my first question is, what's the hematocrit? And the answer is always something less than 30. And I would say, call me back when it's normal. That means 45 to 48. I never get a call back. So, the, so if the question is, should I put in another venous drainage cannula? So I switch to central cannulation, which just happened in a big famous hospital where I was visiting last week when the hemoglobin is 25, the hematocrit is 25, preposterous. So just uh, remember that the, the risk of uh, very, running at very high flow is significant. You want to run the lowest flow you can at the normal hemoglobin, which is that. So that's the message. Now, changing gears. Having known that many, many years ago, I had the opportunity of taking care of this young lady, a newborn infant with a severe respiratory failure. We didn't know exactly what the cause was. You can see a nice, full-term, happy, healthy-looking baby with PO2s in the teens. Uh, PCO2 is in the 80s, clearly dying. Uh, the neonatologist called me and my partner, the surgeons, because we're the pediatric surgeons for the hospital, and said, y you're working on that machine to take over lung function. You want to try it? Sure, why not? So we went over to the lab, cleaned it up, and hooked it up to this pretty little baby. And uh, what do you know? She got better. I don't usually take the time to go through this bit of physiology, but this is her clinical course over the next 10 days or so. And I'll just point out one thing. This is blood gases and 
ventilator settings and so on. But here she is, hypoxic, hypercarbic, hypotensive, dying, goes on ECMO at this point. Now what? Now she looks great, of course. What's happened? What's the problem? Well, one thing about ECMO is it gives you time to do diagnostic studies. So what shall we do? Let's do an echo. Oh, wait a minute, 1975. There's no echo. Let's do cardiac cath. Can't do that because there's a great big cannula in the right atrium. What can we do? Well, let's squirt a little dye into the perfusion line, see where it goes. What we see is there's a big ductus, not too surprising in a newborn, but the blood's flowing the wrong way. It's flowing from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. That can't be right. Something's wrong. So, so my partner and I trained with a legendary surgeon named Robert E. Gross. When you don't have an answer, you just open the chest and take a look and figure it out. And so we did that, and sure enough, there's a huge ductus, and the blood's flowing the wrong way. And, and if you've ever seen the ductus in a newborn, it's a little scary. It's twice the size of the aorta. It's so thin that you can see the blood flowing through it. But if you can get around it without getting into it, then, then we tied it off. And what happened? The pulmonary artery ballooned up, the right ventricle ballooned up. She would have died on the spot if it not the fact that she were on VA bypass. So what's going on? So we put a catheter in the pulmonary artery. So here's the important part of this little graph. Pulmonary artery is twice systemic. I mean, that's, that's what happens in a fetus, but it's not what happens in a normal baby. For some reason, there's terrible resistance to flow through the lungs, and this has got to be a fatal situation. There's no way to deal with it. So we were measuring this pressure. We went back to the ICU just because as all of you understand better than anybody, you never want to have a death in the OR. You get somewhere else and it's not on your head anymore. We went back to the ICU and I went in to turn it off, but what do you know, this pressure is starting to drop and CO2 is starting to come out and oxygen is starting to be absorbed. So over the next uh, few days, this PA pressure goes back to normal. Lung function is normal and uh, with this, this little girl recovered, not only recovered, but she looked really good. So several months later, she looks like this. She's shown, shown here with Pauline, her actually foster mother. And then I lost track of her altogether. She, she moved out of the state, so did I. And we uh, lost touch with her until many years later, uh, we found her. Now, her name is Esperanza because uh, she was actually an uh, named by the nurses Esperanza, which means hope in Spanish. Her mother was Spanish, and uh, she's shown here at the age of 21. And uh, all of you, if you get involved at all with the ECMO business, you've, you've learned about Esperanza, you know about the name, because I've used that in various addresses and papers and stuff like that, and it uh, represents where this business all started. So with that, I'm really proud to say that today you have an opportunity to meet Esperanza, who's visiting with us here, thanks to Bill. Thank you for inviting her, and Espy, come on up and say hello to people.